This may well be one of the most important pieces of information you'll ever receive. You don't have to be a scholar to learn. Learning fast, powerful learning of any subject you choose can be made easy beyond most people's fondest dreams. Only taught a few simple actions that make facts pop right into their minds. Yes, actions, not theories, not principles, not abstract rules that demand a genius to put them to work, but simple physical actions, things you can do immediately, as simple as picking up a book the right way, copying down problems on a piece of paper so that they have solved themselves. These learning actions were not invented by me. They were the result of years of work by teachers, tutors, authors of speed learning, adult education courses, management training executives, in fact, who has been given the responsibility of making learning easy and making it fun. These are simple actions designed for practical people who are pressed for time but realize they have to learn to forge ahead in life. How to flash read the printed page that you will eventually be able to pull the core ideas out of many books at the rate of 30 books in about 30 minutes. For example, how to become a whiz at mathematics, or how to build a power-packed vocabulary, how to double your problem-solving ability, how to bring facts, figures, memory, how to write simple, clear, compelling English. Remember, there's no theory here, just step-by-step -step methods, techniques, actions that give results overnight. This is a course in learning how to learn, not by dreaming about doing. So work. In the past few years, a great many people have become confused. They've become so fascinated with social studies, physics, foreign languages, and the like, that they have forgotten how simple a good education really is. A good education, a bedrock education, an education succeed or fail for the rest of your life, consists of just three simple skills. The ability to read, the ability to express thoughts and words, and the ability to solve mathematical problems. In other words, reading, writing, and arithmetic. The old time have forgotten it, and we've got to get back to it. These are the foundation stones. Everything else, all the advanced subjects, depends on them. For example, if you can't understand what you read, you can't read science. If you can't express your own thoughts, you can't write, say, g If you can't solve simple problems in addition or subtraction, then you won't even be able to start on calculus or aerodynamics. Most people waste at least half their reading or learning time because no one has ever shown them how to organize their work. Organization plan direction. It is a procedure, a system, a planned schedule of events or tasks, one after the other, that gets something done in the shortest possible time with the least amount of waste. It is doing the right thing at the right time and not wasting your time doing the wrong. In regard to your learning growth, therefore, organization is basically a way of sitting down at a desk finding out what has to be done, opening the right book to the right page, starting to do it at the beginning, learning it step by step, knowing when it is finished, and then remembering what it is you have done, how you have done it, and what use you can put it to tomorrow. Without such a definite step-by-step -step plan of attack, you waste much time because you will not get down to work immediately. You will not be sure exactly what it is you're supposed to wander aimlessly until you stumble on it, and then you may lose it again or waste time reading on after you've learned it or forget it before you get to use it the next day. Therefore, the most beautiful thing about organization is that it is far simpler and far easier than what you are and it's so easy to put it into practice. The first step in organizing your study habits is to set up a daily work schedule and make sure you stick to it. There's just no substitute for daily regular study. For a certain amount of time spent daily on each subject learning, becomes incredibly easy if you maintain a steady pace from start to finish of the subject you want to learn. Then there are no sudden pressures to get things done, no near hysteria about deadlines, no tensions and anxieties if you are going to take a test to a subject. Let's look at such a daily schedule and see how simple it is to set up and how easy it is to follow. Here is a sample of a daily achievement schedule Monday through Friday. 7 a.m. get up time. 7.05 to 7.30, wash, dress. 7.30 to 7.45, breakfast. 7.45 to 8, help around the house. 8 to 8.10, final preparation for work. 8.10 to 8.30, going to work. 8.30 to 8.45, pre-work talk with friends. 8.45, regular work schedule. 12.45 to 1.45, lunch. 1.45 to 5.45, work. 
5.45 to 6.05, going home. 6.05 to 6.30, dinner. 6.30 to 6.45, help with cleanup. 5 to 7, make ready for study time. Get all equipment together. 7 to 8, study hour, or half hour, or whatever time you prefer. 8 to 11, watch television, read, relax. 11 to 11.15, prepare for bed. 11, sleep. Saturday, a free day. Sunday, a free day. Now, the exact details of this schedule are, of course, merely suggestions. Your own family activities may dictate different dinner hours, relaxation breaks, and so on. But the important points are clear. Every day, there should be a definite period of study, a definite application of what you have learned, without exception, without excuse, and without delay. This study period is essential to your career, and it must start at exactly the same time each night. It must be entered into without delay, and it must be a concentrated check of what you've learned before you can close your books and go on to something else. All right, let's take a closer look at that daily study period and see how we can make it produce twice the results for you. Here are some tips to double the value of each study hour. Do not do top work in your study period unless you make that study period as important to you as your work downtown. This means, two, you must have a definite place to study. It must be the same place each night, with no one else having any claim to it for that hour. Three, it might, with the physical equipment you need to read and write permanently stored there, instantly at hand when you want to use it. Four, there must be no distractions from that hour. This means ideally a room with the door closed, no radio or television, no interruptions, no friends with phone calls permitted for any reason. When you get down to work, you stay at work until you're finished. This means no other members of the family with you, no conversations nearby, no rustle of newspapers. You need silence to concentrate, and you make whatever sacrifices are necessary to give it to your survive. This ruling of outer distraction goes one step further. It also means that you have to yourself at study time all the equipment you need and nothing more. No unnecessary books, no newspapers, no pictures on the wall to draw away your attention. Study is a business. Six. Make sure that you start your lessons at the same exact moment every day. A five-minute delay can kill an entire study period. The phone conversation is cut off, and you are at your desk at the precise moment you are scheduled to be there. Seven, you are a constant daily psychological readiness to study, an automatic ability to concentrate that can only come from getting down to work at the same time and the same spot every day. Once this routine is established, waste motion is eliminated and work flashes by. Period. When you are ready to review that work, you will be delighted at the quantity and quality of it. Now the first requirement to be a good reader is mastery of words. As you read, as you listen, as you gain information from any source whatever, you will learn new words. Word learning is one of the most important parts of your education. For words are the tools of thought, mental tools that make thought far easier, far more exact, far more powerful in solving the problems that you encounter in everyday life. The more words you learn, the more metal they The purpose here is to show you how to master these tools. All right, let's try a quick word game right now that you can practice in just two minutes a day, anywhere, without the slightest training and vocabulary building. A word game that will pull out hundreds of power-packed words from your hidden and put them to work for you. Let's call this simple exercise the change the word game. Search for substitute words in your conversation and see what magic changes you can make when you fit them in. For example, take the magnificent line from the Old Testament, in the field and Cain rose up against Abel and slew him. What would happen if we changed the key words in this sentence? Would we make the sentence better? Would we add or subtract meaning? Ask yourself to try it and see. Perhaps you will replace rose up with words such as cons blindly hated, treacherously attacked. Or perhaps you will replace slew with such words as killed, murdered, butchered, assassinated. Which of these new words is the most exciting? Which carries the thought best? As you play on, you learn to search for exactly the exact color and meaning of what you want to say. You feel at home with all kinds of words, small and large, simple and exotic. You add drama and depth to everything you say or write, and you see the difference almost immediately the way people stop and listen to you, and you alone. Now, how to teach yourself to identify strange words without looking them up? Now you are ready to play the most thrilling and profitable game of all. Learning how words are built, 
recognizing the meaning of the words without having to interrupt the reading to look them up. So can be made an adventure in learning if you follow this simple two-step plan. First of all, you have to realize that all words are built up part by part, just as a model airplane is. Words, however, are much more simple. They have just three simple parts. First, M, which tells us the basic meaning, such as go. Number two, there is the front part or prefix, which adds another meaning of the word, such as out, plus go equals outgo. Then, number three, there is the end part, which gives us still another meaning. For example, ing, which rounds out our word to give us out, plus go, plus ing, to add up to outgoing. Thus, we can build one big word out of three small ones. A new word, which is much easier to remember, takes far less space to write, and actually gives us a brand new meaning that we wouldn't have had with the three small words at all. This is the way language grows, by taking two or three small words and building a new word out of them, giving us new meanings to solve new problems. There are three basic building blocks to build new words. The root, the front part, and the end part. Some words have only the root, like hear. Others have only the root and the end hearing. Still others have only the root and the front part, like unheard. And still others have all three parts like unhearing. Now, how does this knowledge help you recognize strange words without looking them up? In a very simple way, is that you don't recognize are actually made up of smaller words in exactly the manner we have just described. They are made up of the same three basic building blocks we have just examined. However, most of these small word parts are in Latin, for the very simple reason that Latin was the ancient language of our own English language. Therefore, in order to work out the meaning of the strange words, the first time you see it, all you have to do is learn these Latin word parts and see how they fit together to make new words. Listed in the booklet that accompanies one of the most common Latin and Greek word parts in our language. It has been said that from a mere 12 of these parts, we have built over 2,500 English words. No wonder it pays you such incredible dividends to learn one or two of them every day. Use the booklet size to carry with you if you wish. You should also have a good big loose leaf notebook with a special page on which you note any new word parts you discover. Also make words out of the word parts and enter them in your notebook. This is easily one of the most fascinating games you can play. And now let us discuss how to become a master reader. Good reading is a search, a search for big ideas. Good reading is an aggressive, active search that has three steps. One, locating the main idea. Two, separating that word from its unnecessary detail. And three, boiling that idea down into a few easily remembered words. You become a good reader, therefore, only when you master this technique of searching and boiling down. Searching and boiling down. Until you have taken the entire assignment, hundreds upon hundreds of words, sentences, and paragraphs, and reduce them to a few vital thoughts that will sum up the meaning of them all. And that can be burned into your memory forever in a few short moments, ready to be put to use to some business or to answer questions in an examination the very instant you need them. Fortunately, the authors of your textbooks agree with this roadmap idea. They too believe that you should first build an outline of important thoughts in each lesson and then simply in order to help you do this, they have built into their books certain signposts that point out these main thoughts. These signposts stick out from the main body of the text. They are the chapter headings, section headings, table of contents, and all other by capital letters, underlining, italics, and other attention-drawing devices. They form a book within a book, and by learning how to read them, you can pick out the main points in that book almost as fast as you can turn its pages. Let's see how to really use it. Let's start with the big signpost, the ones that will give you the guts of the entire book in five to ten minutes. Now, a book should have a title. Actually, a good title should give you, in a single phrase, the main theme of the book, what it is about and what it is not about. It is information about what you are to learn in the pages that follow. Make sure you understand it before you read on. For example, the title, How to Double Your Power to Learn, here is a deliberately long title containing two entirely separate pieces of information. First is your ability to learn. Second, 
a specific goal to double that ability. Starting from this title and knowing exactly what you should get out of this book, you read on with one purpose. Answer the question, how? How do I double my ability to learn? Answer this question, you turn to the next big signpost part of the book. Any book for that matter. That would be the table of contents. In the table of contents, you find the grand plan, the ultimate goal you are shooting for, and break it down into a step-by-step -step process. Steps you have to take one after another to attain that goal. This table of contents is actually a ready-made outline of the book. It should be studied carefully before you read one word of its text. By carefully going over the table of contents, you immediately gain an overall picture of the skeleton. See the relationships between each of the various chapters and the main theme of the book. Know exactly where you are going when you start to read, to such a degree that you can actually set up a time schedule of so many pages per chapter per day to finish the book when you have to. Then there's the index. The index is a storehouse of minor topics of special interest to you. There they are alphabetically arranged for instant reference. For example, if you were reading a book about George Washington and you wanted to know about the time when he was a surveyor, you could look at the index. Then you could flip directly to the page you needed. You use the index to keep you from searching all through the book. Then let us discuss the introduction, preface, or foreword. This is the author's personal message to you before he gets down to the box. In it, he may explain why he chose this particular title, or tell what compelled him to write the book. Or he may show you in advance what he is trying to accomplish, or give you a brief one or two paragraph condensation of the contents. Or he may list the sources where he got the information, or list the reasons why this book should be important to you or in any other way give you a brief outline of where you will be heading in the book and what benefits it will give you. It is a personal note, a personal touch that rounds out the book and gives you insight into the author himself and his purpose in writing the book as well as its contents. When you have finished this introduction, you know exactly what goals you are out to get. And then, reading on through the table of contents, you realize step by step how you are going to get there. You are now ready to read the text itself, to cut through it to the heart of its main ideas, and do it almost as fast as your eyes can move down the page. Let's turn to the individual chapters and see how this same exact method, those first, can again mine their information for you at a single glance. You will find sample chapters printed in a booklet that is part of this course. First, glance over them briefly. You will come back to them later. As you can tell at a glance, it is simply not enough for you to focus word by word from start to finish. If you try to do this, you'll confuse detail with many ideas, and you'll remember almost nothing of what you are reading. What you need is a key, a system that will unlock the words and pull out the main ideas for you. This reading, the ability to read chapter signposts at a glance and use them to pinpoint the main ideas of the chapter, one after the other, and give purpose and direction to your reading. There are six signposts in every chapter that you should know as well as your own name. Chapter title. Now this tells what the chapter is about, what it includes and does not include. For example, in sample chapter one, the title is The Greeks. The second chapter sample gives the information in its title. Five reduction tells you that you must find a specific number of ways to reduce costs. All right, to return to sample chapter number one, the first chapter was headed the Greeks. Now the signpost parts of every chapter background do not tell how many parts are to follow. They do tell you that you are going to study the Greeks and what you're going to look for in the first part of the chapter, for example here, the Greeks, is the effect of their background upon them. You must now read on to the next chapter signpost to discover what you must find around. To do this, we turn to the section headings. The section headings break down the overall chapter heading into its main parts. They list the names and numbers of the important subjects to be covered in the chapter. Now, reading them quickly, without the intervening text, skeleton of a chapter. For example, the section headings in our second sample chapter read as follows. Road 1, raw materials. Road 2, the cost of capital equipment. Road 3, manufacturing costs. Road 4, plants. Road 5, General and Administrative Expense. Now here are the five roads to cost reduction mentioned in the chapter title. 
They are laid out for you at a glance. You know now the entire structure of the chapter. Your only task now is to re-find out how you can reduce costs in each of these areas. In sample chapter 1, about the Greeks, the section headings are fewer in number and are more vague. They are Aegean civilization and the setting of Greek civilization. In sources of the background of Greek civilization. But they do not yet give you enough information on what you are to find out about each. Therefore, you must go on to further signposts, which we will describe in a moment. Signpost 3, the introductory paragraphs, points out what to look for in the text that follows. He gives an introduction to the chapter, ties it into the chapters that came before it, and reveals the main thought or thoughts in the material in the remainder of the chapter. For example, in the first sample chapter, with the introductory paragraph. For the purposes of this survey, let's break the paragraph apart. Point out each of the main thoughts. The ancient Greeks developed the first government that might be called democratic, and the first great civilization to take root on the mainland of Europe. This is the introduction to the chapter, pointing out the importance of the Greeks to all of us. It goes on. Yet the Greek civilization that matured almost 2,500 years ago was by no means purely European in character. Now the author leads us from the introductory sentence in the background of the Greeks. This is what they are going to discuss in the material that follows. The Greeks are going to inhabit the western coast of Asia Minor and the islands dotting the Aegean Sea, as well as the European peninsula we call Greece. We are told the first important geographical setting. They also inherited some of the legacy we owe to Near Eastern civilization, probably passed on to them through ancient Aegean civilization. And now we are told the second vital influence is the Aegean civilization. The paragraph confirms the two main divisions of the chapter, the Aegean civilization and the geographical setting, which was revealed earlier by a survey of the section headings. All right, now you know you're on the right track, but you're still looking for further subdivisions so you continue chapter signpost. Usually, you would next check the summary or closing paragraph. The summary paragraphs are the author's last words on the chapter. They are his own outline of the material he has covered in this chapter before he passes on. They are he deems important out of all the material you have just read. Sometimes, he sums this material up in one paragraph. Sometimes, he outlines each idea in a separate phrase paragraphs it and may even number it. Sometimes he repeats an inform of questions. In any case, these final words deserve careful study before you begin the text. For example, since there is no summary paragraph in our first sample chapter, let's use the one in our second chapter as our example. It the five roads to cost reduction are 1. Raw materials 2. The cost of capital equipment 3. Manufacturing costs. 4. Sales expense. 5. General and administrative expense. Once possibly covered, it is necessary to prosecute them vigorously, lest they fail from inertia or resistance to change. These sentences confirm what you have already discovered. You are now doubly sure you have the five roads to cost reduction firmly outlined in your mind. Actually, on the basis of the last paragraph in the summary, now you have to read on to discover how you can reduce costs in each of these areas. You turn now to the next chapter signpost, number five, the first sentence of each paragraph. Especially if the author has done his work well, these first sentences are called topic sentences. They give the main idea of the paragraph and let the remaining sentence fill in the details. So, if you take the remaining sentence of each paragraph and string them together, you should have a fairly good idea of the main idea. For example, the important first sentences of each paragraph in the chapter are these. We will give each sentence the number of the paragraph it comes from, and we will leave out the first introductory sentence. Aegean Civilization Aegean civil for some 2,000 years, down to about 1100 BC, apparently is centered on the island of Crete at the southern entrance to the Aegean Sea. When copper and the manufacture of bronze were introduced, probably from Phoenicia or elsewhere in Asia Minor, sometime before 3,000 civilization began on Crete. The archaeological remains, however, provide convincing evidence that the Minoans were great builders, engineers, and artists. Crete, at the height of its power, may have controlled an empire, 
including the other Aegean islands and perhaps of Asia Minor and Greece. Thanks to Schleman and later experts, we now know that by 1400 BC, Troy and a group of cities centered at Mycenae in Greece had attained a degree of civilization strikingly similar to what had apparently been reached in these earlier. Now, under the setting of Greek civilization, the forces of nature played a large part in shaping Greek civilization. The Greek homeland, however, had one great geographical advantage. Its situation encouraged navigation, even by the geography of Greece favored decentralization. These are the first sentences of each important paragraph in the chapter. Already in choosing them, the boiling down process has begun. Already unnecessary words and details have been thrown away. We're looking only for main ideas. You therefore choose only those paragraphs that contain those main ideas. But how do you know which paragraph to choose and which to leave out? In a very simple way. You already know the main theme of the chapter, the Greeks. The background was given to you in the chapter title. You already know that the main sources of that background are Aegean civilization and a geographical setting, which are given to you in the chapter headings. And you are looking for the big contributions. Therefore, you will judge each sentence by these two simple rules. They must talk about the main theme of the chapter and not about some side issue. In this case, he must talk, the author, about the Aegean contribution to the background of Greek civilization ground, and about nothing else. He must bring in a humane point and not merely furnish details about a main point brought up by the paragraphs before. These are the rules as to what to leave in and what to throw out. All right, you have now finished your quick survey, have pulled out its main thoughts and turned them into questions. You are now ready to read the text to answer these questions. Let's see how you do this in the shortest possible time without missing a single vital point. Always, of course, your first goal is to improve your ability to understand everything you... But this search for understanding does not conflict with the second vital goal, to speed up your reading rate. Fast readers are good readers and most people who read slowly do so because of one or two crippling habits they picked up in their school years. Liberate those habits reading speed overnight. Since you will be faced with a flood of paperwork in your lifetime, now is the time to build in that speed. Here are five simple tricks that will do it for you automatically. One, don't let yourself point out words with your finger or a pencil. Read with your eyes only. This means your hands must be folded until you turn to the next page. Two, keep from moving your lips or mouth. Lip movement slows reading speed down to speaking speed. If it is difficult for you to stop moving your lips, by a pen you lose the habit. Three, don't move your head from side to side. This tires you out and again slows you up with your reading. Only your eyes should move. Only your eyes and nothing more. Four, read aggressively carrying the ideas out on the pages with you in this course. Five, learn the habit of skimming and then concentrating. Make every reading assignment a search for main thoughts through a forest of useless words. Skim through 90% of those words and concentrate only on 10% and then become an expert. Until these habits become second nature, until you can zip through any written page anywhere. Now in your day-to-day -day life, when you are submitting a resume, for example, for a job or submitting an application for membership to a certain club, a saying can ruin the entire impression you are trying to make. You cannot afford to be satisfied with anything less than your spelling 100% perfectly. And you can do it if you follow these simple rules. In the first place, don't try to improve your spelling with misspelled words and trying to correct them. These lists only concentrate your attention on the wrong spellings. Instead, focus your efforts on the right spelling the right way. Realize that the reason you misspell any word is because you have a distorted image of that word in your mind. It is to get rid of that distorted image and replace it with a correct one in such a way that it is burned forever into your memory. Now you do this in three simple steps. Step one, see the hard part of the word correctly. As you know, most words that are misspelled are misspelled in only one word. 
Either you have added a letter where it shouldn't be, or forgotten one where it should be, or put in an E before an A, or doubled the letter when it should remain single, or some other simple mistake. But once you have developed that distorted image of the word, mind, you misspell that word over and over again, always in the same way, always in the same place. From that moment on, there is a part of that word that you automatically misspell. There is that hard part which you will now concentrate on. First, you will check over the misspelled words. Then you will locate the hard part of each of these words. There are one or two letters in there that you automatically rewrite correctly, this time capitalizing those hard letters. To see how you write it, see the sample words that are given in your book. Now, copy this correct spelling on a sheet of paper over and over again with the capitals in exactly the same place you have put them. Write the word over and over and over again, capitals and all, until you have got it down pat, until you can see the correct capital part of that word with your eyes shut. Then you have completed your first step. You are well on your way to perfect spelling. Step two, build an automatic memory to spell the hard part of the word correctly. Now you're going to reinforce the correct picture image of it. You're going to do it by creating a simple spell-alike to help you remember how difficult letters go. You are going to create an automatic memory tie-in between the difficult part of the word and an easy-to-remember spell-alike. There are three spell-alikes. Try them in the following order until you get one that you automatically remember. First of all, look for familiar words within the hard words to make them easy to remember. Make up little sentences that make these little words. Tie these and the hard words together. The secret was kept by the secretary. Then you will find more samples in the booklet. Step three, get the feeling of writing the hard word correctly. All right, now that you have capitalized the hard part of that misspelled word, and after you thought to remember its correct order automatically, then you are ready to build the correct spelling of the word into the written reflex without even thinking of it. Take a piece of blank unruled paper. Write the word in natural script without the capital letters, but this time big as you ordinarily would. Twice as big over and over and over again. Write it without looking at it. Never hesitate. Don't stop in the middle. If you get the word wrong, run through the first two steps again, and then return to the twice as big writing again, over and over you build the writing of that word into a mechanically perfect skill. Until you get the word letter perfect, until you can write it correctly as casually as you write your own signature, then it belongs to you. You have it forever. Now, how to make these three for you every day? To learn a new word, as we have said before, is to know its meaning, its use in a sentence, its correct pronunciation, and its correct spelling. Until these are letter perfect, you really don't know the word at all. As you advance through your business and social, more and more important new words, some of them you will misspell. Therefore, you should have a spelling section in the back of your notebook. I suggest you keep the spelling section for your reading notes and or home study courses. Divide the section into two parts. Call the words and mark down in it any words you misspell. Every night, take one of these misspelled words and use the system to teach yourself its correct spelling. Therefore, when you have that word letter perfect listed in the second part of the spelling section under the title Mastered Words, when you have a list of 10 or 12 of these mastered words, have someone dictate one or all of them to you in a paragraph or short story, and then check each of their spellings. If any of them, then, are misspelled, put them back in the front part of the section and start all over it. Because you haven't established the correct habit yet, but you will before you know it, you'll be amazed at the absolute precision you show in these spelling tests. And once you have mastered a word, use it as often as possible. This will help you practice to keep the correct spelling fresh in your mind, build confidence, show you over and over again that you no longer have reason to be afraid of misspelling that once terrifying word. And now we turn to your ability to express thoughts on paper. Professional writing secrets that will enable you to write top-grade letters, memos, speeches, sales presentations, reports, and what have you. Words can come from your mind. Let us discuss how to write as easily and quickly as you think. The farther you advance in the business of the social world, the more you'll be required to prepare resumes, inter-office memos, engineering reports, business and social letters, club minutes, and all of this vital work will be written. 
All of it will require that you be able to set down your thoughts, suggestions, goals on paper so clearly and so persuasively that those papers serve as your best salesman. Therefore, the ability to write well is equally as the ability to speak well. You must be as fluent with your pen as you are with your tongue. You must be just as much at home writing a technical report as you are telling a friend about a ball game. You must develop ease in writing. Now, ease in writing and precision in writing come in two of which are available to you. Number one, practice. Number two, planning. It is a combination of those two that give you power writing. All right, let's see how you can build both of them into every written word and how you can discover exactly what to write from the every written paper. Like reading, and perhaps even more so, writing demands a plan of attack, a definite goal that you want to achieve in every composition, and a definite plan to get there. A series of questions that puts you immediately on the right road and each word you write to the last. Let's look at such a series of direction questions right now. Let's work out a typical idea. For example, a paper you might prepare for a magazine article or a speech before your club and see how these questions and answers avoid errors or of what you have to say and cut your writing time in half. Let's take a subject such as, should America try to be first to land a man on the moon? All right, let's assume that you answer the question with a yes, that America should be the first to land a man on the moon. Fill up the subject. Now, first of all, you should ask yourself these questions. What exactly should I write about in these papers? Whether to write about whether America should be first to land a man on the moon, or can I express this idea in a single key sentence before I begin to write? America should be first to land a man on the moon. How much am I going to say about it? Am I going to list the reasons why America should be the first to land a man on the moon? What am I not going to say about it? Because I don't have the room. Two things. Number one, I am not going to list as aside why America should not be first. And two, I am not going to discuss any of the technical problems that we will have to overcome to reach the moon. What are the specific points I am going to make about going to the moon? The specific reasons why we should be first. Prestige. Because it will aid our economy. Because it will yield new inventions that we might not have otherwise discovered. Because it will give us new military strength and because it fulfills man's destiny to explore the universe in which America can and should be in the form. How many of these points are there? In what order should they be arranged? Which should come first, second, and third, and so on? Which of these points are the most important? Which should be given separate paragraphs? Which points should I group into one paragraph? What is the best way to catch my... Probably with a strong, emphatic assertion at the very beginning. Probably something like this. There are at least five vital reasons why America should be first to put a man on the moon. Any one of them more than justifies this project's course. How can I think of a good last sentence before I begin to write? Yes, a summary sentence something like this. Therefore, to keep our military strength from falling behind, to maintain our prestige, to strengthen our own economy, to reap the benefits of otherwise overlooked race, and to assure America's leadership at the forefront of human destiny, it is essential that this country be the first to place a man on the moon. Now, how do you perfect your composition before you write it? The above give you two major benefits. They force you to use a forceful, clearly formulated, concrete, and specific approach with no chance of wandering beyond chosen limits. And they help you write about this topic one step at a time with each step in its proper place. Now, without such a blueprint, you simply won't know where you're going, and revising your paper will take you more time than originally writing it. All right, here are some tips now on writing that develop clarity and power. One, every paragraph should contain only one main idea to develop it. When you go on to discuss a second main idea, start a new paragraph. This has been shown over and over again in the examples we have given before. Two, each sentence in its turn should contain only one idea. The great mistake that most poor writers crowd too many ideas into a single sentence. This results in huge, clumsy, poorly understood sentences. When you get to a second idea, or find two or more ideas crowded together in a single sentence, separate them and build each into its own sentence. For example, the wrong way. 
When we arrived home from the trip, tired and dirty, we immediately went upstairs where we unpacked our clothes and hung them up before we were allowed to take a shower and go to bed. Now, this would be clearer and more powerful. We arrived tired and dirty. We immediately went upstairs. Yet before we allowed ourselves to take a shower and go to bed, we unpacked our clothes and hung them up. 3. Long sentences are usually confused sentences. One sure way to avoid this mistake in the sentences is to keep the subject and predicate of each sentence as close together as possible. For example, the man whom Tom had seen earlier that day running away from the bank spun around when he saw Tom. Now, the subject of this sentence is... The reason the sentence is confusing is that this subject and predicate are separated so widely by the clause whom Tom had seen earlier that day running away from the bank. Therefore, to make these two thoughts far more powerful and clear, they should this. This would be the right way. It was the man whom Tom had seen earlier that day running away from the bank. When he saw Tom again, he spun around. All right, going on. Four. Make sure your sentences are connected correctly, not the relation between one sentence and the next. Otherwise, your reader won't know where your train of thought is going. Connecting words are and, yet, but, so, or, for, however, therefore, thus, otherwise, because, and so on. They point out to your reader what the second sentence has to do with the first, what your third has to do with your second, and so on. These are some examples. Now a good exercise would be to go through a few pages of any good book and underline the connecting words. Ask yourself how each connecting sentence ties in with the sentence that goes before. This way, you will gain skill in using these tie-in words, and your papers will be a powerful procession of closely woven thoughts. Now, part three has to do and can improve his skill in mathematics. Unfortunately, most adults, men and women alike, are simply awed by mathematics. They realize it produces more and more business and financial failures than any other deficiency. They have unpleasant memories of it from their own classroom days. It consists of nothing more than brain-twisting problems with no relation to everyday life, down to the amusement of super eggheads and ivory towers. Now, nothing, of course, could be farther from the truth. When you get right down to it, the basic principle of all mathematics, from arithmetic to as simple as ABC, and as practical as a screwdriver, it can be stated in one clear sentence. Mathematics is thinking by steps to solve problems. Just that and nothing more. Mathematics is the art of solving problems step by step. The key is step. Even the most complicated problems can be broken down into one simple step following another. Now once you learn this secret, you have licked mathematics. One of the most difficult parts of mathematics for most people is the fact that it is abstract and it deals with ideas that they cannot picture easily in their mind's eye. Therefore, these abstract ideas become hard for you to work with when they would really be quite easy if you just made them into physical models that you could see. This simple rule, the construction of physical models, will help you every time you are in new abstract ideas. Otherwise, you will not be able to see or touch or picture them immediately, and you will have trouble with them for this reason alone. Therefore, if you wish to feel at home with abstract mathematical ideas, your first job is to construct physical ideas that make them easy to work with. Now, because you have to see the models, turn to your booklet and you will find this section all set up for you. You may think it is simple, too simple, but the model method has hidden power. Decimals are hard for us. They don't realize that they've been working with them all their lives in the form of dollars and pennies. A penny is the decimal part of the dollar, one one-hundredth. So is a dime a decimal part of the dollar, one-tenth or point one zero. Oh. A quarter is one-fourth. A half dollar is one half or point five oh. Train yourself at least at the beginning to substitute the word pennies for decimal points when you begin to solve decimal problems. Thus, the problem, what is point two five of one, what part is twenty five cents of one dollar, which becomes how many quarters in a dollar, which you can answer instantly. All other decimal problems are equally a cinch once you think of them in terms of money. Percentages are just multiplying by anything more than the decimal part with the period in front of it removed and the percent symbol placed after it. Thus, 10% is equal to 0.10, 0 
and you already know that 0 0.10 equals one-tenth of a dollar or ten cents. Thus, 10.10 equals one-tenth of a dollar equals ten cents. Percentages are used to multiply other numbers by. If you want to find 25% of 100, you multiply 100 by 25%, or 0.25, bankruptcy scale, where you're only going to get 25 cents on the dollar. Thus, 25% of 100 is 25. Now this image of a bankruptcy scale may make percentages quite easy to do, for the simple reason that it turns the abstract idea into physical dollars and cents. Try it for a while. The results may amaze you. Now, algebra may be thought of as a game, a series of riddles in which someone hides a number and you have to find it. The number that is hidden is replaced by it. For example, x equals 2 plus 3. To find x, you simply add 2 plus 3. The puzzles get harder as the game goes along, but the rules are still the same. Letters are substituted for numbers, and you have to rearrange them in the numbers. Thinking of it in this way, algebra becomes quite simple and quite a lot of fun. Geometry was invented to solve physical problems, engineering problems, building problems, farm problems. Later, you act. Now your job is to make it physical again. You do this by building models, triangles made of matchsticks, circles made of string, rubber balls serving as spheres, physical objects that you can measure open and close, compare. This is especially important in solid geometry, which is practically impossible for you to understand without physical models. Here, five minutes spent putting together and taking apart plastic models, say, of a cylinder will be worth two hours of act. Let's now investigate how to make complicated problems half solve themselves. Now, so far in this section, we have concentrated on the fundamental skills of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. You must master these first to any form of more advanced mathematics. However, if you pursue a business or scientific career, you will, of course, be presented with far more complicated problems. Problems that may involve as many as a dozen or two dozen steps. Problems that are given to you out of the range before you can even begin to solve them. Problems that are stated in words as well as numbers and demand that you can read as well as you can figure. These complicated words and number problems cannot, of course, be solved by blindly rushing into them, like any other part of your studies. It's demanded in order to simplify and organize. Not one, but three separate skills are required in order to master them. One, reading. Two, reorganizing. Three, problem solving. For example, take this typical everyday problem makes a profit of $500 for each ton of paper that it sells, how much profit does it make on an order for 46,000 pounds of paper? Step one, read the problem. The first thing you do, of course, is actively read the entire problem word fully and carefully with pencil in hand. Now, step two, ask what is given. When you have understood the problem completely and marked the facts, you ask yourself, what is given? What does this problem tell me? What are the facts I have to start with? They are simply that your company makes $500 on every ton of paper, and you have an order for 46,000 pounds. Step three, ask what answer is called for. In this case, how much profit will my company make on an order for 46,000? Step four, ask, is there a hidden question in this case? What is it? The answer is yes, there is a hidden question. That question is, how many tons in 46,000 pounds of paper? Now, step five, how many steps do I need to solve this problem? Now, you decide how many little problems there are in this big problem. In this case, there are two. Number one, finding out how many tons there are in 46,000 pounds. And two, find what you make from this figure when your one ton is worth $500 profit to your company. Now. Step six is to find out whether to add, subtract, multiply, or divide each step. Step one, you must divide or 2,000 pounds into 46,000 pounds to get the number of tons. In step two, you must multiply the answer of step one by $500 to get your final answer. Step seven, 
Make sure right order. Ask yourself, what do I have to do first? What do I need to do second? And so on. Then, if necessary, rewrite the problem in the correct order to solve it. In this case, the steps are already in the correct order. Step 8. Do and in this case, do it on a bit of scratch paper right now. 46,000 divided by 2,000 equals 23. And 500 times 23 is $11,500. You simply took the answer you found in step 1, which was 23, and you used it to multiply it in step 2. So the answer is $11,500 profit. Listening to these techniques, even learning them, is not enough. To yourself is not enough. Even memorizing them is not enough. They're no good to you until they become second nature, until they are built into your nervous system as reaction patterns or habits. Until you do them automatically, perfectly, without thinking, as easily and naturally as you need. And this means practice, practice, practice. In life, as you know, ultimately, it is drive that counts. The tortoise still wins, and the hare is left sleeping in obscurity. A winner never quits, wins. This is old wisdom, but true wisdom. Practice makes perfect. Wisdom that works today. So, good luck and good learning. This may well be one of the most important pieces of information you'll ever receive. You don't have to be a scholar to learn. Learning fast, powerful learning of any subject can be made easy beyond most people's fondest dreams if they are only taught a few simple actions that make facts pop right into their minds. Yes, actions, not theories, not principles, not abstract rules that demand a genius to put them to work, but simple things you can do immediately. As simple as picking up a pencil, opening a book the right way, copying down problems on a piece of paper so that they have solved themselves. These learning actions were not invented by me. They were the result of years of work by teachers, tutors, authors of self-education courses, management training executives. Everyone, in fact, who has been given the responsibility of making learning easy and making it fun. These are simple actions designed for practical people who are pressed for time but realize they have to live life. How to flash read the printed page so well that you will eventually be able to pull the core ideas out of many books at the rate of 30 books in about 30 minutes. For example, how to become a whiz at mathematics or how to build a power-packed vocabulary, solving ability, how to bring facts, figures, old books into your memory, how to write simple, clear, compelling English. Remember, there's no theory here, just step-by-step -step methods, techniques, actions that give results overnight. This is a course in learning, not by dreaming about doing. So, let's get to work. In the past few years, a great many people have become confused. They've become so fascinated with social studies, physics, foreign languages, and the like, that they have forgotten how simple a good education really is. An education upon which you will either succeed or fail for the rest of your life consists of just three simple skills. The ability to read, the ability to express thoughts and words, and the ability to solve mathematical problems. In other words, reading, writing, the old timers knew it, we've forgotten it, and we've got to get back to it. These are the foundation stones. Everything else, all the advanced subjects, depends on them. For example, if you can't understand what you read, you can't read science. If you can't express your right, a good advertising copy. 
If you can't solve simple problems in addition or subtraction, then you won't even be able to start on calculus or aerodynamics. Most people waste at least half their reading or learning time because no one has ever shown them how to organize. Organization is simply planned direction. It is a procedure, a system, a planned schedule of events or tasks, one after the other, that get something done in the shortest possible time with the least amount of waste. It is doing the right thing at the right time and not doing the wrong thing. In regard to your learning growth, therefore, organization is basically a way of sitting down at a desk, finding out what has to be done, opening the right book to the right page, starting to do it at the beginning, learning it step by step when it is finished and when it is right, and then remembering what it is you have done, how you have done it, and what use you can put it to tomorrow. Without such a definite step-by-step -step plan of attack, you waste much time because you will not get down to work immediately. You are what it is you're supposed to learn. You will wander aimlessly until you stumble on it, and then you may lose it again or waste time reading on after you've learned it or forget it before you get to use it the next day. Therefore, the most beautiful thing about organization is that it is far easier than what you are doing today. And it's so easy to put it into practice. The first step in organizing your study habits is to set up a daily work schedule and make sure you stick to it. There's just no substitute for daily regular study. For a certain amount of time, subject learning, any kind of learning, becomes incredibly easy if you maintain a steady pace from start to finish of the subject you want to learn. Then there are no sudden pressures to get things done, no near hysteria about deadlines, no tensions and anxiety to take a test to earn a degree in that subject. Let's look at such a daily schedule and see how simple it is to set up and how easy it is to follow. Here is a sample of a daily achievement schedule, Monday through Friday. 7 a.m. get up time. 7 wash, dress, shine shoes. 7.30 to 7.40.